Okay, good morning. Uh, my name is Kathleen O'Krulik. I'm a member of the Department of Philosophy here and have been for almost 40 years. So you'll notice the, uh, the historical dimension of this talk. Um, I'm a philosopher of science. When I started, uh, I, like virtually everybody who did philosophy of science at that time, was interested almost entirely in philosophy of physics. And inside physics, there were really just two topics that got a lot of attention. One was general relativity theory and one was quantum theory. So when I was younger, I worked mostly in those areas and I'm still interested in them. But an interesting thing happened along the line that made me start to question, along with a lot of other people, the idea that science is value free. In philosophy of science, probably this was promoted largely by our concentration on quantum theory and uh, relativity theory. There wouldn't be very many social and political values, although there may be some. It was more, uh, for me, a growing political awareness of the way that uh, science is used to justify the oppression of various groups. So uh, for me, it was being an active feminist that made me come to think that maybe some of the stuff I had learned in philosophy of science wasn't quite right. And in particular, the idea that science is value free. And that in fact, this is what defines science. The way that you can trust science, the reason you can depend on it, is it doesn't get all mucked up by values that are political or social in origin, and so it's just the facts, ma'am. I'm going to talk about the way that uh, social and political values influence science, and it's not in order to degrade or dishonor science, it's still our best way of getting empirical information about the world. We just need to do better science by making sure it's not racist, it's not sexist, it's not informed by bad values. Some values are better than others, and we want to make sure that good values uh, inform our science. Because it's not as if we can be completely value-free. You know, we're not some god who's outside space and time and just looking at the world the way it really is. So. Um, the problem uh, that people encountered early on in this discussion was that if you did a case study and you tried to show that there were really values working here that were um, undermining the empirical adequacy of the science, people would say, oh, well, you've just shown it wasn't science anyway. So every time you worked on an episode of science and tried to show, yeah, there are values that work here, it was taken not to show anything about science, except that that episode was unscientific. So it's a sort of catch-22. That situation changed, and um, part of it was because of the amount of social upheaval uh, in the late 60s and the uh, early 70s. Again, focused mainly on gender and race. Most of my work is on gender, and that's what I'll focus on here. This slide, which is the famous mark in, uh, march in New York City in 1971, is here just to acknowledge the political motivation for some of the work here. By feminists who really liked science, I mean, if you're a philosopher of science, you don't go into that because you hate science. You go into it because you really like it. And so in our discipline, um, the approach was different from, say, in some literary studies, in which the lesson that people took away was science is just a crock. It's a tool of the patriarchy, it's a tool of racists, it's nothing but politics. In philosophy of science, that wasn't the view we took. We tried to say that the science is going to, to some extent, reflect the values of its time. How can we make it better science, okay? But I do want to still acknowledge that a lot of the motivation came from the fact that, you know, if it was religion oppressing women, for example, people could say, oh, well, you know, that's a faith thing, what can you say? But if it's science, those are just the facts, ma'am. You have to wrap your head around it. And when I immigrated to Canada as a graduate student, you know, I was desperately trying to feed myself and get money. I would go around and apply for bank jobs and stuff. And I had to fill out forms about my medical diseases, including having periods, not having periods, you know. All of this was considered a scientific basis for good employment practices. So I'm old, but I'm not so old that this is irrelevant now. Um, so a lot of the early work on science and values dealt with medical sciences, because it was really doctors that controlled women's lives pretty much entirely at that time. Um, and there's lots of really good literature on that, but I'll just point to a few of the obvious things. If you take the male always as a sort of paradigm human being, you get really bad research. And the most striking result was with the National Institutes of Health in the United States, right? 
where you have mostly fantastic medical research, large randomized controlled trials, very scrupulous attention to technique and so on, except in good faith, I think, it was assumed that if you don't want confounding factors, if you really want the pure human being to do your research on, it has to be male. Because, you know, women have hormones, and that's a confounding variable. Well, guys have hormones, too. But if you're thinking that the paradigmatic human being on which you should do research is a male, and typically a white male, then your data reflect only what's good for them. And what happened late in the 20th century was the National Institutes of Health had to go back and redo much of their previous research, making sure that the sample was more representative of the population, because you're going to make inferences from your sample to your population. So virtually, I mean, even when I was a student, what medical students learned about female sexuality was just perverse. Um, women were basically in control in the control of their doctors because almost everything that happened was considered a medical problem. If you're nursing or you're not nursing, you're pregnant or you're not pregnant, uh, you have menopause or, <laughs> or it's delayed, all of this is a medical problem that has to be dealt with and that completely controls your life chances. So it was in large measure a change in the politics and a change in the value systems, at least in North America that led to new avenues of scientific research opening up. And eventually, all this takes longer, the ability to get grants and so on to try to figure out how social values might affect research. The point that I really want to emphasize here is it's not just bad science that's laden with the values of its time and its place, but even some of the greatest science in the world does it. I mean, Anybody who's naming the top few scientists in the history of the world is gonna have Charles Darwin in that list, right? I mean, he was brilliant. He changed how we think about everything. And yet, uh, feminist theorists, and I note here Ruth Hubbard because she's extremely old and she won't last forever, but she's at Harvard and she did so much just to change the way we think about um, the impact that Darwin's assumptions in evolutionary theory had on other disciplines as well. So she shows how Darwin implicitly assumed that males are active and females are passive, and so human evolution is driven entirely by male struggle. Why are we intelligent? Because males had to fight in order to you know, kill those big animals and drag them home. So this is a quote from Origin of Species, and this is not to diss Origin of Species, it's just to show that it's a product of its time. Darwin said, men have had to defend their females as well as their young, from enemies of all kinds, and to hunt for their joint subsistence. But to avoid enemies or to attack them with success, to capture wild animals and to fashion weapons requires the aid of the higher mental faculties, namely observation, reason, invention, or imagination. These various faculties will have thus been continually put to the test and selected during manhood. Thus man has ultimately become superior to woman. And it's a good thing that men pass on characteristics to their daughters, he says, because otherwise it is probable that man would have become as superior in mental endowment to the woman as the peacock is in ornamental plumage to the peahen. You know, so you have these spectacular male peacock tails and these really boring <laughs> brown females. He's saying, if it weren't for all that male struggle uh, creating benefits that the daughters enjoy too, this would be the, uh, the analogous difference. Again, this is not to say Darwin was stupid or a jerk or anything like that. Uh, even before feminists talked about uh, values in Origin of Species, a lot of Marxists had pointed out that Darwin's views of the animal kingdom and how it's organized, I mean, for starters, it's a kingdom, but mostly it just replicated British social structure <coughs> to a an extent that was sometimes actually very funny when you go back in retrospect and read it. The, uh, probably the gender assumptions have been more damaging. And that's because it's not just evolutionary biology that uses Darwin, but in many other disciplines, including anthropology, primatology, sociobiology, Darwin provides the background theory. You know, you're assuming it as part of your background. 
And so it has really affected how research in those areas has been done uh, traditionally, although that's, that is changing. So the assumption, not many years ago, it's being challenged in the meantime, is that if you're talking about early human beings, 80% of the subsistence diet came from male hunting and the 20% came from female gathering. So you're talking about hunter-gatherer, the males are hunters, the females are gatherers, and really survival depended on the men. And then as you get changes in the, not just the social organization of the larger society, but departments of anthropology and other sciences, you get people starting to question that and say, well, there's some evidence to suggest that as much as 80% of the subsistence diet came from female gathering. And wouldn't that change how we think about evolutionary theory? Probably this varied from prehistoric culture to prehistoric culture, but it opened up entirely new avenues of research. And acknowledging those values didn't bring down the epistemic credibility of science, instead it raised the bar. I mean, we know now to be epistemically credible, we have to take into account questions like this that we felt free to ignore in the past. So I'm gonna focus for the rest of the talk on scientific theories of female intelligence because that's been a big barrier, sometimes still is, to um, female progress in various professions. One of the most recent uh, incidents and one that still resonates is you may remember that Larry Summers, when he was president of Harvard, uh, gave a speech explaining why Harvard basically had only male engineers and he used uh, a hypothesis that uh, although the mean and the median for IQ are the same for men and women, you get way more male geniuses. And a really good school like Harvard just hires in that little lump at the end. That had a huge impact on Larry Summers' career. I mean, if you read the newspapers, you'll know it's still having an impact. He lost his job at Harvard. Uh, it continued to plague him, you know, what he has said. And most recently, President Obama tried to nominate him for a very big position, and he didn't have a chance, mostly because of female opposition tracing back to that incident. So people are a little bit more careful uh, since that happened about uh, what they say. And again, I don't think political correctness is the name of the game here. It can't be. It's, it has to be a question of attending to the evidence and attending to the values that inform that evidence. The aim is to make better science, not to trash science. At least, you know, people who do the same kind of work that I do. So Anne Foster Sterling is a biologist. Uh, this is her first book, and it still cracks me up reading this part about human intelligence. The obvious explanation of why women are so stupid compared to men is, well, they're smaller, so their brains are smaller. What do you expect? But then you think about that elephants should be way smarter than human beings. Whales should be way smarter than human beings. So you go back to the drawing board and you come up with a new hypothesis for explaining male intellectual superiority. I mean, that's not being questioned. It's just taken for granted that males are intellectually superior. So you come up with a different idea. Well, the real thing that matters is not absolute size, it's relative brain mass. So we measure intelligence by the ratio of brain mass to body mass. Only it turned out that women would then be smarter than men so that can't be true. Back to the drawing board. We won't do this all the way to the 21st century. We'll just go through a few more corrections. You can see things are getting a bit desperate, trying to find a biological basis for uh, male superiority. Greater intelligence is linked to a lower ratio of facial bones to cranial bones, uh, but that would make birds smarter than human beings. So back to the drawing board. And so it went. Uh, moving into the 20th century, early 20th century, a lot of it was about parts of the brain being more important for intelligence than other parts. Uh, one hypothesis was that intellect resides in the frontal lobes, which are bigger than women, in bigger in men than women, whereas women's parietal lobes are proportionately larger. But then there was research that suggested that the parietal lobes are really the seat of the intellect. So you had to go back and say, well, actually women have smaller parietal lobes. And it just went on and on, you know, through the 19th century, early 20th century. Now the frontier is neuroscience. And if you've been down to Coles or any of the popular bookstores, you've probably seen books that say, you know, now I know why I can't do math. Neuroscience has shown me women can't do math, things like that. 
it, so it's the sort of popular cultural explanation or justification of different sex roles, different sex opportunities. Um, but even in more scientific cultures, you see a lot of the same battles being refought. I mean, we're not talking about elephants and birds now, but we're talking about fMRIs. And so our department, for example, the Department of Philosophy here, has very close ties with the Mind Brain Institute. And so our graduate students can do training uh, on fMRIs if they're going to be working in philosophy of neuroscience. And this has made a really big difference to the presentations at the end of this, ep this part of my uh, graduate history of science course because they come in with the fMRI experience and they can see all the assumptions that you have to make in order to read an fMRI. People think of it as a picture of the brain, but it's not. You're interpreting a lot of data to tell a story. And so, uh, we don't talk so much now because it's politically incorrect about female inferiority in intelligence. We talk about difference. And so the fMRIs are supposed to show that female intelligence is different from male intelligence in ways that could make a difference to what you're good at. Right? Now, this is an empirical question. It may turn out that there are very interesting differences between male and female brains, but just reading back into the fMRIs, your old views, and finding the evidence there because you're looking for it is a kind of science that's laden not with egalitarian values but with uh, sexist values from the past. So there has to be some, some pushback, not only against the popularization, but also scientists who aren't really necessarily out to make a political point, but just keep assuming, you know, the old stereotypes about men being smarter and women more intelligent. So feminist, neurophys uh, feminist neurofeminism has arisen more recently as a way of trying to criticize. And it's explicitly value-laden. It's, it's feminism informing neuroscience as opposed to more traditional values informing neuroscience. Neither is value free, they're just coming at it with different values and then the question is which is going to produce better science in the end? Because we're still, that's what we're still interested in. So uh, some of the stuff is pretty technical, um, but Cordelia Fine wrote a book which is, if you're interested in the question, you may want to read it. It's, it's not really easy because it is uh, well-informed and accurate, but it's written for the general public rather than for scientists. And it's called Delusions of Gender, How Our Minds, Society, and Neurosexism Create Difference. It came out in 2010. It won a lot of prizes. Uh, it was really, really very well received. Uh, if you don't feel like reading an entire book, uh, you can see one of her many articles. One of them is called Will Working Mother's Brains Explode? It's a short article that will give you the flavor of the argument, okay? Because again, a lot of people are trying to interpret that fMRI evidence as uh, additional reason to think that women are better suited for lower paying jobs. They won't say lower paying, but for certain kinds of jobs that require, uh, not that you'd be so smart, but that you'd be empathetic and keyed into emotions. So, thank you very much. I'll be happy to answer any questions you may have. Anybody? Okay, well, uh, I'm not sure what your next venue is, but somebody in this room will know. Um, yeah? Yeah. Uh, I'm just videotaping, so I probably yeah. shouldn't ask the question, but I videotape a lot, and I didn't know, and I'm sure the students are aware of the, the, the breadth of, of things that philosophy of science studies. I mean, this is a very interesting area. I've been thinking a lot on climate change. Yeah. I'm almost impressed with the, with the diversity even within that field, people who study philosophy, biology, ecology, physics, from climate modeling, and all those kinds of things that are very, very um, current and important to this generation. Yeah, that's a good point, actually. Uh, we have the Rotman Institute, um, that focuses on philosophy of science located in our department. And I spent about 10 years out of my life corresponding with Mr. Rotman to get that money and everything. Um, 
And he was very interested in the value question in science. This is uh, Mr. Joe Rotman, who just died unexpectedly very recently. And um, originally it was called the Rotman Institute for Science and Values. So the idea, the reason, or part of the reason that we have focused on issues like climate change, uh, among others, is because we want to talk about science in its, you know, best and most technically well-developed form, but also talk about the social impact of the models that we choose, the social presuppositions of the models that we choose, and um, have been able to attract some of the very best climate scientists in the world to the symposia and conferences that we've had on climate science. So um, for quite a number of problems, we can now actually not just feel respectable looking at the social side of uh, science, but also get money for it, which makes a huge difference. It's no longer a, a sideshow. It's no longer the case that things are the way I described at the beginning, that you know you can do quantum theory or you can do relativity theory. We recognize uh, the importance of philosophy of biology, and we've hired philosophers of biology who um, also run you know, very important and fascinating conferences. We don't yet have anything like philosophy of chemistry, but we have a lot of people whose specialty is environmental science. Um, an increasing interest among the grad students, especially, in uh, delving into new areas. How do undergrads, I ask this, because uh, the people I film, they have backgrounds, that they've got backgrounds in physics and economists and, and ecologists and biologists and, and, and computer people who do climate modeling. So they come from all these very scientific backgrounds. And they often seem to have multiple degrees. Yeah. So do, do, the, do the students here, if they were interested in, in pursuing this, I think it's a very, very important area to pursue too, because our world needs people to help <laughs> these issues. And the way philosophy like, teaches you to think about things and address things. Um, do the kids, uh, do the, the students here, do they, do they have to first go and do a degree in biology or ecology or in physics or whatever and then do the, the philosophy or they do it right from the start? I think it's, it's, it's probably better and more efficient to do it right from the start, you know, making sure that you are at the very least scientifically literate um, while you're pursuing your philosophy degree. But also um, choosing courses that will increase your scientific literacy, uh, because some of the things we work on are not things covered in high school. Um, if I try to think of our department, even though we're one of the most lopsidedly philosophy of science departments in the universe, <laughs> I think most of us did uh, philosophy as undergraduates. It's just that one way or another, whether formally or informally, tried to learn the science. The big change, again, is the diversity of Phil of science. It was all Phil of physics at the beginning, or virtually all, with a little bit of Phil of biology. Philosophy of biology is now huge, and probably younger people are somewhat more drawn to philosophy of biology than philosophy of physics. But we also have some uh, Phil of social science, um, and a great strength in history of science, because it's sometimes only when you look back and you see the larger picture and the larger trends that you recognize what's going on. So even if you're not going to be a philosophy major or specialist, we have uh, lots of courses at the uh, non-honors level that deal with these questions because, again, you have a whole bunch of us with PhDs in, mine's like in HPS, History and Philosophy of Science, and a lot of us have HPS doctorates. Some people have straight philosophy but a specialization in science. And if you have a department that's that strong in philosophy of science, you can be sure that we're also teaching entry-level courses and 100 and 200-level courses. So you don't have to commit to changing your, uh, your whole curriculum in order to take advantage of the courses. Some of them will be focused on quite specific topics, you know, where we have different people come in, like food. You might talk about the science, but you might also talk about the ethics. Um, so sometimes we do very special topics like that to introduce students to what philosophy is and how it can make a difference. I mean, the image is still, of, you know, some old guy bent over a table in a dark room somewhere. But if you come over to the department, and I would urge you to do that, uh, it's not that kind of place at all. And to a large extent, our very vibrant, large group of graduate students 
tends to drive a lot of the engine for us. And that's good, because otherwise we just keep repeating ourselves. Anything else? Well, again, thank you very much. I hope you come to Western and that you check out philosophy when you're here. Thank you.